start recording your presentations. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Karachi Goka. <laughs> I really appreciate your introduction and the invitation from you and also Professor Grant. And uh, I feel uh, privileged to have this opportunity to share some of my uh, recent uh, technical interest in structure mechanics uh, with your faculty and students during this graduate seminar. The, talk, uh, the title of my talk today is uh, a subject that I have been working on in the past uh, maybe five or six years now. It's called the mechanics of structure genome. Try to come up with a new way to do structure mechanics. And uh, we know that the structure mechanics is a very old subject. So I will give some backgrounds and also some basic ideas how to connect with the ancient subject we are familiar with. Then some of the current uh, research projects we are doing are uh, using the concept of structured genome and also the technology transfer of uh, the series and the concepts we have created and uh, how that can be made useful for the industry people uh, do aerospace structures and the materials. So uh, first, the background and basic ideas, as I mentioned that uh, structure mechanics is a very ancient subject, it's very mature. And if you look at the history, it should be over, you know, it's almost 400 years. And a lot of big name scientists, uh, they contribute to this uh, discipline and studied from, I mean, it's not even studied, maybe studied even before Gallero. And uh, you have the simple cantilever beam problem with the concentrated load at the tip. Uh, you know, nowadays we all know how to solve this problem in terms of deflection and also the maximum stress. All the engineer undergraduate students know how to do it. But back into the early days, uh, the days of Galileo, it's very hard. They have to make all kinds of assumptions, come up with some rational way uh, to do the problem. And now, as the undergraduate subject in the beam theory, how we represent it, and I will try to connect that and also reinterpret so that they lead to the idea I have been working on. So we have a three, 3D subject. We know it's very long, and it has a uniform cross-section and it could be made of composite materials. Then what we actually want to do, or we usually do is take some kind of assumptions, like all the Bernoulli assumptions or Timosenko assumptions, then calculate a set of beam properties, the EITGA and uh, GA, and also yeah, their extension stiffness, bending stiffness, torsion stiffness, transverse shear stiffness. Then what do we do? We come up with a set of ODEs, ordinary differential equation to solve the beam problem in terms of bending, torsion, and uh, all the others. After we solve this problem, and then what do we do? We didn't stop here and we go back to find out where the maximum stress is going to be. We use the formula, you know, the moments divided by the moment of inertia and also multiply the the thickness, we know that will be the stress distribution through the cross section. Then we find out where the maximum stress is, then access whether the structure is safe or not. So this is the whole process. But if you look at the, in the terminology I'm going to use, from the 3D structure, which could be made of you know, composite laminates or whatever, to reduce to the one dimensional reference map analysis in terms of beam analysis, that's homogenization. And you come up with a set of effective properties, which are beam properties. Then this beam analysis is the microscopic analysis. And uh, then after you've done this, you get your bending moment diagram, shear force diagram, all that. Then what you want to find out later is the 3D stress. You do a dehomogenization. Try to find out over the cross section, what will be the stress distribution going to be. And if you also consider this uh, cross-section as a microstructure, then everything will link together. And this part, usually we done through the assumptions. We don't basically pay too much attention to it uh, during our undergraduate study. We are basically focusing on doing stuff here. 
then somebody gave us some formulas to calculate this, and also this formula will calculate this. But actually, if you go to have the beans, the cylinder structures made of complicated uh, microstructure, uh, whether it's additively manufactured or whatever metal materials uh, made beans, then you'll find out you need uh, more than just the simple assumptions which work, or the balloon type of assumptions work for isotopic homogeneous uh, materials, you need a constitutive modeling. This simple assumption may not do the work. Okay, that's one idea there. And the second idea, you know, let's go back to the classical plate theory, when that applies to the laminates, we call the classical lamination theory. So we take two types of assumptions there. First, we take the Kuchikov assumptions, get the kinematics, what that does is to give us a plain screen uh, problem. Then we also make the plain screen assumptions. Suppose we have 3D constituent relations like this, but actually we use the Q, which is a plain screen reduced constituent relations. And we know these two set of assumptions, they are conflicting with, with, each, uh, with each other. And uh, at the end of the day, what we come up with is a two dimensional theory over the reference in terms of screen displacement relations and also constitute relations. So the idea will be the same. You know, how do we calculate the APD matrix is through all the thickness is a kind of like a, a calculation with respect to the thickness coordinates only. So if we take the transverse normal line, we have the capability, of course, the classical lamination theory, take the assumptions to calculate the APD matrix. Then we, we come up with the plate analysis to do the plate analysis. After we've done that, we recover the streets uh, for each layer. And uh, again, basically what you have is that for a 3D body with heterogeneity through the thickness, we reduce it to a two-dimensional surface. And that's a homogenization procedure with the effective properties. And after we've done the analysis here, we go back and uh, do the uh, dehomogenization, and we will get the Stress distribution of the original structure. And this part again has been done in traditional structure mechanics by assumptions, but it's actually a constitutive modeling part which we are focused and also will be solved by mechanics of structure genome. And uh, if we, you know, if you're familiar with the traditional structure modeling approach, then you'll find out that basically. Uh, uh, most of research is they are doing, for example, we want to construct a plate model. What we do is that we try to assume the three D displacements in terms of two D displacements and the possible rotations, which are unknown. Then also some known distributions through the thickness. Then these assumptions, you know, this through the thickness could be say linear assumptions. You have CLT and the first order shear deformation theory. You could have high order assumptions. Then you have high order series. Uh, you could uh, zoom it for each layer. You will have zig zig like zigzag uh, models and also layer wise series. And uh, uh, most uh, famous uh, researchers along this direction is Jan Reddy and Riasma. Uh, they did a lot of work, and also there are many others uh, doing along this line of research. The problem with this type of modeling approach is first, many a priori assumptions, and uh, that will affect the accuracy and also generality of your model, uh, because the models will only uh, be as good as your studying assumptions. And also assumptions, as I mentioned, is sometimes is self-conflicting. For example, the classical lamination theory, where zoom, you know, could you go for assumptions, then that basically gave us the plain screen kinematics. Then we also use plain stress. We know for solid plain stress and plain screen cannot coexist. Uh, as long as your Poisson's ratio is not equal to zero. And uh, also there's no rational way to know the loss of accuracy. You know, sometimes that the first high order uh, series, not necessarily better than the law or the series. So at the end of the day, in industry, people say, you know, I have uncertainty, but I basically have to deal with more complexity. I will just start with the simplest, like the classical lamination series, instead of go to higher order models. And also that they have new models, higher models, higher order models, 
we introduce new kinematic variables. That means that we need to develop special purpose elements for the structure analysis. And also a lot of advanced structures, they may make assumptions for mechanics, uh, not necessarily works for other physics like temperature and electricity and uh, all the other fields could be active in the multifunctional structures materials. And also new materials usually require new assumptions and that's not good. And uh, uh, finally, there is no intuitive connection between the conventional materials and uh, the, so the reusability. It looks like that uh, you learned a lot of stuff in undergraduate study. When you go to your research, find out a lot of what you learned is not applicable. Uh, that's not good. We want to see how that's still connected to the fundamentals. And also the tradition approach will be difficult to handle heterogeneous and build up structures like uh, a cylinder uh, with stiffened, uh, a stiffness. If you still want to analyze a shell, then the traditional approach will not work. If you have a honeycomb uh, sandwich structure, that will also have difficulty. And what uh, people usually do, they will smear this out with a homogeneous layer then to analyze as a sandwich structure, but that's not necessarily uh, the correct way to do it. Uh, the reason being that uh, I will explain the reason in a moment. And also you could have a plate like this. They are perforated with all holes there. You don't have transverse normal there. Then how do you make the assumptions so that you, you still want to get the bending behavior, the deflection and all the information you want to do. And then you could have others. For example, you could have a helicopter rotor plate, but at the end of the day, you want to use a beam element to do the flight simulation of the helicopter. How do you get it from all this information, your torsional stiffness and the bending stiffness to work with? And the simple out of the assumptions not work at, at anymore. And also when you do the area elasticity design of aircraft, the whole wing you may treat it as a beam. And uh, in terms of torsional stiffness and bending stiffness, and you will see you have all the complexity there. How do you deal with that? That's also a difficulty. And uh, of course, you will have heterogeneity along the spinewise direction. And also, you could have the materials all changing inside the structure. All these pose difficulties for us to use traditional approach to, to handle the problem. And also, the materials and structures. And, uh, you know, this, uh, you may realize the fact that a lot of research is going on is directly re related with new materials. And structure mechanics and structure research has been pretty, pretty quiet uh, in recent decades. And uh, that's, uh, that's some situation we should change. And the structures and the materials should uh, directly related with each other. And all, usually we are not only focused on the material performance, we focus on structure performance because that's what is matters. At the end of the day, we make a structure. But the problem is that uh, in the community, we have constant confusion between materials and structures. And what is a material? What is a structure? We, we don't exactly know how to uh, tell the difference. And in my mind, first, materials does not have presence of boundaries. Material is a matter. A structure has a defined shape, geometry, and the in interaction with the uh, with, uh, the external world, like uh, you have boundary conditions, materials, you don't have to deal with boundary conditions. And uh, if you really want to think as a material, material is what a structure made of, uh, let's put it that way. And then when we try to do the characterization, the material properties and structure properties are different. Material properties, we're talking about in terms of Young's modulus Poisson's ratio. Structure properties, we're talking about the uh, bending stiffness, holding Positional stiffness, shear center, and the neutral axis, this kind of stuff. And the material behavior and structure behavior is also different. Material behavior, talking about hardening, softening, and the fracture. And structure behavior, we mainly talking about buckling and the, uh, vibration. Those will be this kind of behavior we're talking about crippling. And also models, they will be different. The material models, we're talking about the Hooke's law and uh, some other nonlinear models. 
if we have to deal with nonlinear material properties and material behavior. And for structure properties, of structure models, we're talking about beam models, plate and shell models, and 3D solid models. Basically, you have structure models talking about you deal with a body, have a defined boundary, with the defined interaction, which is boundary condition, and also load and the environment, environmental effects uh, uh, affect that to that body. And that body could be in different shapes. And also the confusion of the structures materials also could be confused structure material behavior. For example, there is a paper published uh, uh, in Science 2017. Uh, the title is basically what they do is they come up with a meta material. And uh, when you apply compression or tension, it will generate a twist. And you know, if you only have one unit cell, yes, you will have this kind of behavior. And if you arrange the unit cell along one direction only, you will have that behavior too. Or along two directions, just like a plate. So you have 10 by 10 unit cell arranged. Then you will have this behavior too. But if you arrange this unit cell along all three directions, say 100 by 100 by 100, you will not get this behavior uh, uh, now. So basically, it's a structure behavior. Extension and the twist, the coupling, that can be happened even at uh, plus minus 45 laminates. So indeed, that uh, what has been done in that paper, we right, can easily use a beam model or plate and shear model to reproduce what has been done in that paper, that results. And uh, it's not a three-dimensional uh, material behavior, but it's a one-dimensional or two-dimensional structure behavior uh, if we really want to make a distinction between structures and materials. And uh, as I mentioned, the most research has been you know, going on in the materials domain. And the main initiatives are the materials genome initiative and uh, integration, uh, integrated computational materials engineering. What they're trying to do is to, you know, to use experiments, computational tools and data together to come up with a better way to to develop uh, and deploy materials faster and cheaper. But this uh, uh, this initiative or materials type of research they are oriented toward the constitutional relations or models or properties for the material, particularly if we're dealing with composites, we're dealing with fibers, matrix, and interfaces. But if you're really working on structure in terms of, say, a helicopter or uh, aircraft or fighters or cars, then if you want to make them of composites, you're talking about the several length scales you have to cover from the carbon fiber, which is in terms of microns to meters. And they are around six uh, length scale we need to cover. and uh, and and this would not be easy to handle by materials uh, research only. So it must be somehow taken care by structures, but uh, we cannot do it in the traditional way as what we do structure mechanics. And uh, I said here that even one material, one millimeter cube material block, you're talking about the million degrees of freedom. If you want to do the analysis just by, by capture all the details, uh, in the uh, structure system, that's uh, that's impossible. We have to go through some kind of uh, model scale approach to do it. And the, the traditional approach, what we do is that uh, we take a microstructure and do a micro mechanics calculation, uh, get the material properties, kind of like a smeared properties. For example, if we're dealing with laminates, unidirectional fiber reinforced laminates, we have lamina constants. Then we construct the structure mechanics models. And these two are basically not uh, connected in the past. Uh, they have different uh, assumptions for themselves. They have different set of models, range from analytical, semi-analytical, and numerical. And uh, doing the problem this way, they have a fundamental scale separation assumption problem. And uh, for, for this approach to work, this micro scale must be much smaller than meso scale. For example, I have a panel 
uh, made of different layers. The real panel will look like that. Of course, you have more fibers there, fibers will be smaller. But if we do it like this approach, this approach, what we actually end up is that we made of three homogeneous layers. Although the material properties are different, and uh, it, it will be okay if the fibers are much smaller than the layer thickness uh, for the global uh, behavior, like a uh, stiffness and uh, deflection of the plate. But it will not be okay for the strength uh, because strength directly depends on the stress. For example, that uh, we're doing this way, we create the artificial discontinuity between the layer interface. Because the layer interface, if we are doing perfect bonding, then it's a single reason material. We should not have different uh, material discontinuity there. The material discontinuity, what really happens is between fiber and matrix. And uh, for some, sometimes even this approach does not work for certain structures, which I just showed a moment ago that you have honeycomb. So traditionally what they do is take a unicell, do a calculation, then this layer, replaced with a homogeneous layer, then as if it's made of five layers, a sandwich structure to the sandwich, sandwich analysis. But the issue there is that uh, when you do the micromechanics calculation for this layer, the size of the unit cell is similar as the thickness of the plate. And there is no, this scale separation is not valid. The micromechanics and structure mechanics must be considered at the same time. So to avoid this problem, what I have been doing that the look at system, we know when we do a structure analysis is a combination of 3D solids, 2D plate and shells, and 1D beans and single beans depends on the geometry of the component. If you have all three dimensionals, uh, all three dimensions are similar size, we're dealing with 3D solid. We have one of the dimension much smaller than two other dimensions, we're dealing with plates and shells. We have one of the dimension much larger than two other dimensions we're dealing with beans. If I, we have all three dimensions, they are very different, we're dealing with single beans. When we do structure analysis, we have 3D solids, uh, solid elements, and uh, 2D plate and shear elements, 1D B elements. That basically become our mathematical model. And But we have to realize for this simple line actually represent, could represent a box beam for each wall made of dozens of composite laminates. For a surface element here could be made of a stiffened panel with the skin and stiffness made of woven fabric and all that. So what we try to come up with is that how do we represent mathematically this line, uh, this box beam in terms of these nine elements. And we know under those elements, their corresponding model, and uh, you're, if you're familiar with structure mechanics, we will know that a particular model will contain three parts, uh, including kinematics, that's the strain displacement relations for different models, and the kinetics, that's the equilibrium equation, and the energetics, that's the constituent relations. So that's a very similar, I use the simple model, the simplest model to illustrate the idea. And uh, for composites or advanced materials, what has been different is the constituent relations will be different. The stiffness matrix could be fully populated, and the extension and the torsion could be coupled, you know, all that. Not necessarily only have the diagonal terms like traditionally what we do. And so with that perspective, what we do is that uh, we come up with the idea of the structure genome. I will uh, explain a little bit more. So basically, consider the system. And uh, as an engineer, we decide what type of elements we needed for which components. Then we also look at the material makeup for that complaint, uh, component. Then we decide to minimize the information loss between these two model representations. That's basically what the mechanics of structure genome does. Take whatever the information from material science we have to construct the corresponding structure models. It's a form of framework that does not ex exclusively rely on direct information passing across scales, but operates from the homogenized behavior, captures the details at scales relevant to your problem. And it's not only a concept, it's also a theory and it's a mechanics. 
and uh, it only has uh, three basic steps. First, what we need to do is that we need to explain, express the kinematics of the original model in terms of that of the microscopic model. For example, explain, express the 3D displacements in terms of play the displacement, but we have some information we don't know. So we should have some unknown there instead of make assumptions assumed to be to be known. That's what traditional approach does. Then next step, we need to express the information of the original model in, for example, screen energy or total potential energy in terms of the uh, kinematic variables of the model I want plus the unknowns. That's the second step. Then the third step is to minimize loss of information between my original model and the model I want to solve for the unknown. The traditional approach, uh, structure mechanics approach to assume this either equal to zero or some linear distribution. Here we solve by minimize loss loss of information between, for example, your or the validity model and the original 3D elasticity model. So the, the structure genome concept, they need a little bit more explanation. And uh, for 3D structure analysis, depends on the material makeup. We could have one dimensional structure genome, if, for example, if you have the, uh, the structure is made of binary composites, and then you, you will have this uh, two segments repeating implant to build the binary composite, repeating through the second is build the 3D solid. So the structure genes defined as the smallest mathematical building block of your structure. So it's smallest and also mathematical. So that's why this can be aligned. But if you have unidirectional fiber reinforced composites, we can deal with a two-dimensional domain. And uh, because two-dimensional domain can be extruded along the fiber direction, build that slice of material, then sweep along in plane and through the second is build the entire structure. If we indeed have a material like a particle reinforced composites or woven composites featuring 3D heterogeneity, we need to deal with the 3D block. What we want is the 3D constituent models for the 3D analysis. So out of this one dimensional analysis, for example, for linear elastic behavior, we need to get the six by six stiffness matrix for the 3D uh, solid analysis. And after we've done the 3D solid analysis, uh, we should be able to obtain the six strings and string component within the original structure, still within this one dimensional or two dimensional analysis. And uh, some of you may be familiar with RVE analysis. And this basically for 3D structures provide us a, a good way to do the uh, micro mechanics is a general purpose micro mechanics uh, in a way. But uh, comparing to the RVE analysis, we will find out it will be simpler. We don't have boundary conditions to apply, and also we don't have to do pre and post processing, and it will automatically satisfy the or mandel uh, conditions. And also it will be faster because it's semi analytical, it will convert faster. And uh, second, that uh, we can get the 3D properties and stress stream fields out of 1D or 2D or 3D SDGs. For example, for RVE analysis, you have to take a 3D block to, to obtain the, all the Young's modulus Poisson ratio and shear modulus in three directions. But for us, we can take a two-dimensional domain to do the problem. And uh, also, for you to get all these six species components for RVE analysis, you need to take a 3D block. For us, a uh, two-dimensional domain will be sufficient. And uh, lastly, here that uh, we can compute the complete set of 3D properties using one analysis. And, uh, but for RVE analysis, you have to do multiple analysis to get the material properties along different directions. Mm -hmm. Let me see why the, the computer a little bit frozen here now. Okay. And uh, next it will be more versatile. And uh, it's a simple theory for all heterogeneous materials, could be periodic, partially periodic, or periodic materials. And the SD, you don't have to be rectangular or, or cube. Uh, it can be arbitrary shape and more accurate 
we verified for three D periodic materials. It will be it will achieve the same accuracy as the RVE analysis analysis and also asymptotic homogenization. But for partially periodic or periodic uh, uh, materials, always achieve the best accuracy. And if we go to the uh, use a simple illustration like the black aluminum approach in industry. What they do is that they take a laminate, they treat it as a, uh, treat it as a homogeneous material. So that's uh, uh, with a black color, that's why I call the black aluminum approach. And traditional approach, what they do is that they take the, they will make the implant, pro uh, they obtain the implant properties using classical lamination theory from the A matrix. The order of plane properties, they will make different assumptions if we want to get this through the segment CTE and the Young's modulus. And if we uh, use our approach, what we can do is uh, look at this through the segment uh, information, that's our structure genome. Then we know that uh, what will be our original model, what will be the model we want, and we minimize the energy loss, and we should be able to get the result without uh, taking those traditional assumptions. And how about if we're dealing with a panel and that a lot of advanced structures there in terms of panels. And uh, again, it depends on how the panel is made of. If you have just a laminate, then you're dealing with a transverse normal line, that's your structure gene. And if you have a corrugated plate with corrugation going in one of the directions, then you're dealing with a two-dimensional domain. If you have stiffened panels, then you're dealing with a three-dimensional domain. What they want for the global structure analysis is the APD matrix. If you use the classical shear or plate element, then APD matrix out of this one-dimensional analysis, two-dimensional or three-dimensional analysis. And at the end of the day, you also want the stress within the original structure. So after you've done the uh, plate and shear analysis, you're going back through this uh, structure gene. You get the stress and strain distributions within the original structure. And this, you'll find out that it provides a unified approach to solve all the panel problem as long as you want to model it as panel, no matter what is sandwich structure, laminates, corrugated structure, or stiffened panels. And uh, that's one thing. Secondly, that uh, you will find out it has a connection to the micromechanics and model scale modeling. If we consider the reference surface as a two-dimensional generalized continuum. Then every material point on this reference surface, we have a corresponding microstructure to give us the effective plate and shell properties. And also give us the localization, the local fields within the original structure. So the traditional plate and shell theory becomes a special application of micromechanics for example, the classical lamination theory, as I mentioned, that the convention approach, they self-conflicting, uh, take two sets of assumption. But if we use the MSG, what we need to find out is that first, what will be the original uh, model, which is 3D elasticity, and the layer is different. And what the model we want uh, is a microscopic, two-dimensional classical plate model, for example. Then what is our structure G is the transverse normal line. And we write out the energy for the for this uh, model and minimize the energy loss. We will find out the APD matrix and the corresponding uh, equations without making the traditional assumptions. How about we're dealing with a structure very long, like a helicopter rotor blades or deployable booms? What we can do is that it depends on the structure if we have a very long uh, and the uniform cross section, the cross section will be our structure gene. A structure a cross section analysis will deliver us the beam properties uh, to work with for the beam analysis. And if we also have a heterogeneity along the span wise direction, we will deal with 3D block. And uh, at the end of the day, what we compute out of this is a torsional stiffness, bending stiffness for the beam analysis. After we done the beam analysis, we can go back to get our stress and strains within the 3D structure. And again, you can find out that uh, this approach provides a unified way to deal with all kinds of slender structures and uh, also uh, link our beam series to micromechanics in a way that uh, 
if we treat this as a generalized continuum, every material point on this 1D reference map have a corresponding microstructure to give us the effective properties and also corresponding local fields. And uh, we, I think we had this problem and uh, if we have a say, strip, we want to modify the plate, then the idea will be the same. The only thing different, it will be the structure gene, now it's a cross section. And you have the original 3D elasticity model and you want to reduce to a one dimensional beam model. Uh, this should be a microscopic model to the one dimensional or the Bernoulli beam model. That will be the corresponding beam model we can derive by minimize the energy loss between these two set of, sets of models. So next I will uh, describe a few applications of this concept and also this theoretical framework. Uh, first is uh, the NASA game changing development. We have been working with NASA in the past uh, two years now. So what they have is a composite boom. You know, they want, and it could be very long, and you, you can see it here, but the problem is that the, after you store it for a while, then when it deployed, it's not straight. Originally designed to be straight, but now it's not straight. You have a kind of like a deflection without any load there. It's because the uh, structure is uh, viscose elastic. And also the another problem is that when you store it for say, usually you pack it first and wait for a few months or even years, then because of the viscose behavior of the material, you lose the spin energy, you cannot get it out. Uh, when, when you are finally in space, you cannot deploy. So that's also a problem. So what we're trying to do is to develop the simulation and basically come up with the approach to, to develop kind of like a virtual testing framework for them, for example, the uh, they have a CPT test to test the relaxation behavior of this material because this material also made of simply a woven composite. And this is a model we come up with. We have this MSD come up with, a, you know, predict the time dependent, temperature dependent structure properties. Then that can be used as a UGNs or Apicus to do the simulation to basically input the plate and shell stiffness uh, for, for this model. And also we have the capability, once we have this uh, material model built in terms of uh, uh, the microstructures and uh, uh, used as UGNs, then in Africa, we can still use a powerful modeling capability to do a realistic simulation of the packaging, which is the folding and also deployment of the structure, you know, this will give us a lot of information instead of just do a lot of physical testing trying the area to see, you know, which material combination will work the best. And uh, we can use computers to do a lot of numerical testing that way. The second uh, uh, project we're working on is the MHD-based heterogeneous element. So the idea is that uh, we have a block of uh, material which is heterogeneous, meshed and modeled using a lot of elements. But that's, uh, you know, when in the big structure, we find out there are too many degrees of freedom. What we want to do is we want to homogenize this block of heterogeneous material in terms of a single element with the nose, the uh, green nose on the boundary right now. It's basically, I want to say homogenize into a eight-noted solid element or 20 day loaded a solid element. So the original model will be the heterogeneous system discretized with many elements are needed for describing the microstructure behavior. And uh, the model I want is a single homogeneous element. I want the effective element stiffness matrix. And also if I have the element stiffness matrix, then I can assemble it and solve the global structure problem. And after I solve the global structure problem, I will have the nodal displacements. Then I can go back to find out what happens 
inside the original heterogeneous structure in terms of the local displacement, strains, and stresses. So the approach we enabled is that uh, we use MSD try to minimize loss of information between the origin model and the model we want. And from the homogenization process will help us to get the effective element stiffness matrix to solve for the nodal values of the homogenized element. Then after we done the global analysis, we can go back to recover what happens in the original structure. And uh, the next uh, topic we're working on is the MSG assessed uh, model scale structure modeling and uh, the uh, it's uh, the machine learning uh, empowered and uh, in these days I think students like to do some machine learning but I have to give you some caution that the uh, mechanics still needed and uh, I have these three guys here it's really a very very insightful and uh, interesting uh, science history yeah, if you know what happens there, we know that the uh, Paco Prahe, he actually did uh, a lot of careful observations of how the heavenly body moves, and, but uh, he has a lot of data. And uh, what, uh, of course, a lot of people don't uh, even uh, know him at all now, but it was Kepler who take that data and did the curve fading, come up with the three laws of Kepler's. And the Kepler did the perfectly, you know, curve fading, but they could not uh, understand why. And it's Newton come up with the universal gravitation law to explain why the heavenly bodies should move that way. So the mechanics we are learning are at this level. And this uh, Kepler, what Kepler obtained is the empirical knowledge. And then what the Brahe had is the data. Machine learning is try to, based on data, try to somehow extract the knowledge. I don't know that if we still have brought his uh, uh, data, use the most advanced machine learning technique, can we come up with the Kepler's law or not? That's a question mark. But uh, I am pretty sure that uh, it will be very difficult for machine learning to come up with the universal law of gravitation. So what we learned, the mechanics knowledge, it has been uh, refined centuries, and that's worth to uh, learn. But uh, you may wonder that because the machine learning is going so strong, it may replace all the mechanics of knowledge. And uh, it's not necessary uh, that way. And uh, what we want to do is that we not uh, say just uh, treat our own mechanics knowledge, don't pay attention to the machine learning, but we can combine both, combine both to, because we do have empirical, empirical knowledge in our system, particularly the constitutive relations, for example, the failure criterion of composites, that's absolutely just an assumption, and then somehow get some intuition from the experiment. And uh, what we want to do is to try to say how we can, first we identify where do we need help, uh, of course, when you do model scale modeling, you will have the computing time. It's going to be a limitation, particularly in a design framework. Uh, second is the assumptions. We have the assumptions for the constitutive models and also properties for the you know constituents like fiber and the matrix. Whatever the material models we have, they are come from the assumptions and also the interfaces. We also make assumptions like perfect bonding some kind of interface going on there. And also we assume the geometry and topology of the microstructure. Those are, we don't have definite, definite uh, mechanics knowledge for, for, for this information. And then we should thinking about how we can use machine learning to help us on this regard. For example, we can reduce the time by replacing basics based uh, model scale modeling using circuit models trained by machine learning. And we can learn the micro scale models and properties using measurable data at the structure scale by physics informed or constrained or guided machine learning. And uh, also we can construct the digital microstructures out of the major data uh, using machine learning. So 
for us to do this, we don't, we cannot treat the machine learning as a black box. We have to break it up because we know there's something which is very true in our system, like the equilibrium equation, the summation force equal to MA and summation moments equal to the angular rotation uh, acceleration and all that. And also the geometry, you know, kinematics relation, they are exact. So this two part of the equation we should keep, we only need to uh, replace our constitutional relations in terms of machine learning based models like uh, artificial neural network. Then we, we build the system together. So we don't have a Hooke's law there. We have a NN model and uh, we have the force and, force and deflection curve tested from the experiments. Then that way we'll have the complete system and the world the ex with the experimental data will help us to learn what will be the constitutional relations for our models, which is the missing information in our system. We did some work there, so I don't go to the details. If you're interested, you can go to some of our papers published in recent years. And last part of my talk is about the technology transfer and uh, have a theory or a model if we don't put it in the hands of the practitioners, the everyday engineers, then the use will be uh, relatively limited. So if you're interested, we have two tools. One is called the GMesh for AC. It's a combination of our code called SwiftCom. With GMesh, you can do all types of uh, structure modeling and materials modeling. Uh, it's available online and it can be accessed by any computer, any device, even your smartphones, as long as you have an internet browser, then you should be able to access and launch it online. And we also have a tool called TextGen for AC. It's a combination of TextGen and SwiftCon, dealing with textile composites, and the two model composites as a 3D, uh, woven composite as 3D solid. So, two-dimensional plate and shells or one-dimensional beans get the effective properties. And those are available. And also we have an app, if you would like to download, it's, uh, you just search for SwiftCom, you will get the app uh, either at your iPhone or your Android phones. And uh, you can do very fancy ca calculations, but the calculations is done at our server. So you, you, you get the results at your end. And we also uh, link our code, one of the code called VAPS to do with a helicopter road place uh, with the army uh, road design optimization framework. That's one of the projects we are doing. It's basically is also put our theory and our technology in the hands of the engineers. And they, what they have is a complete helicopter uh, Designed optimization digital system. Basically, what they're missing is that how to design the plate, the composite plate, the layout, and the skin thickness, and where do I put my spa, and how big, is, and what shape my spa should be, and that will be handled by our technology. And we also integrated with Katia. When you have a win, uh, within Katia, you can take a section card. It will automatically invoke our code and uh, calculate torsional stiffness and shear center, all the section properties for the wind to, for structure design considerations. We also integrated with the uh, Altair and uh, yeah, Altair uh, HyperMesh and OptiStruct. And uh, our code is run at the dynamic link library there. And uh, if you are advocacy user, uh, we also have a uh, uh, interface available for you so that you can take all the capabilities I just uh, uh, illustrated and uh, uh, it's uh, free for you to use again. And also integrated with ANSYS and NASTRIN, it's all there. So as a summary, the mechanical structure genome breaks the bridge, the gap between the materials and structures to harvest the full benefits brought out by uh, the advance in materials research and development. And it also provides a unified modeling for structural materials, featuring anisotropy and heterogeneity, eliminates the invited scale separation and also assumptions within each scales. And it can achieve uh, direct numerical simulation at the efficiency of the 
simple engineering models. And they, they enable us to model advanced materials, uh, including composites, as simple as the traditional materials like the metals, capture details as needed and affordable. And also it power conventional structure tools with accurate constituent models for advanced structures and stroke heterogeneous. And you still stick to back to your critical flow model and all the model, but uh, have all the information captured due to the uh, new performance of the advanced materials. And lastly, but not least, that this method unifies the micro mechanics and structure mechanics for multi scale structure modeling. And this part is really uh, insightful and uh, very rewarding because, you know, as I said by Jacob Branovsky, that the progress of science is a discovery at each step, a new order which gives unity to what, long, what had long seemed unlike. You know, we had a priority, a link, uh, electricity with mechanism, and Maxwell uh, linked uh, both with light, Einstein linked the time with space, mass, and with energy. And now, basically, the micromechanics and structure mechanics are linked uh, through mechanics of structure genome. So you have one theory, and uh, you can uh, do all types of structures modeling and materials modeling together. And there is no separate series and separate uh, categories of uh, subjects. So this is a summary slide. Uh, it's a kind of like a poster, and those are the structural genes we, we deal with, and it could be really up to shape and different kinds of stru structures. But at the end of the day, we make, uh, uh, you know, make, we make a structure in terms of plates and shells and uh, beans. And this is a technology that uh, can perform the virtual testing of the materials and structures, including not only mechanical properties, but also multifunctional properties and also can perform the multi-scale modeling of structures, including composite structures, different structures, build up structures, and sandwich structures. And uh, with this, I will uh, stop my talk and take any questions you could have. Uh, thank you, Professor Yu. Uh, do we have any questions from uh, the students? It looks like no questions. Maybe I still, uh, it's still kind of like a little bit abstract. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions from uh, the faculty? So I have one question. So Professor, it's a really nice talk. So I was wondering, right, how is the structure you know is analyzed? How, how, how is structure genome analyzed? Yeah, you say that the semi-analytical. Yeah, it's semi-analytical and uh, it could be purely numerical. And uh, really, if you look at the, let me see, where is that? Uh, at the end of the day, you, you solve the problem, which is a minimization problem. Let me see here. Onward here is a minimization problem. Yeah, you minimize the loss of information uh, between uh, these two models. For example, right, if you look at your class elimination series they're still here, maybe it's easier for you to understand. So here, that's the Kochikov assumption, but you can add the unknowns here. I will say treat it as a change of variables. So my 3D displacement can be represented by Kuchkov kinematics, but I also lose lost some information. So I add my warping functions or fluctuation functions. So I can come up, I can continue use this uh, considerations to write out the strain energy of the original 3D model. They minimize with respect to the Kuchkov kinematics. 
that will help us to solve the unknowns that are added here. And uh, that will solve the problem and also help us to get the APD images. So that is the idea is that the originally what we are zoomed, as I said, you are zoomed, yeah, you are very familiar with this kind of stuff, right? You are zoomed through the thickness distribution of your displacement or something like that. But these are uh, zoomed uh, in terms of pyromia or something already know. But here, I don't make this uh, assumption. I want to solve it for, depends on how the material is made out. So do we need to analyze the detailed model of the structural gene? Yeah, we have all the details, of course, uh, but when you, when you only have a laminate, you only need to do a one-dimensional analysis. Mm -hmm. But this one-dimensional analysis, you have three degrees. You only have, we'll say, let me put this as W1, W2, W3. So every node, every point, you have three degrees of freedom there. Mm -hmm. And But if you have something like this, then you have to match everything inside the structure gene. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, you do do that. That's what we said here. We do an analysis like this. So if it's a two-dimensional problem, two-dimensional ST, uh, what we do is we do, we, we do match it. But our analysis requires you to do a three-dimensional analysis. Uh, multiple times and all that. But use this theory, we can apply to this problem. Another nice idea is that, a uh, nice feature of this is that is one single theory applies not only to 3D solid, which we produce our analysis and in a much better way, also applies to plate and shear modeling. We can get a better Kuchikov flow model or first order shear deformation model, which is resonant minimally model, or get a better apply to the beam modeling, get a better or a blue beam model without assumptions. Without the allowed blue assumptions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Yu, actually, I have a couple of questions. Uh, really nice presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, so how accurately can this approach work in terms of predicting uh, the failure mechanisms? For example, uh, uh, can uh, this sort of a stress analysis where you go through, uh, run the simulation at a structural scale, can you predict what sort of uh, mechanisms are responsible for failure at the micro scale? Yeah, because you basically, you do the structure level analysis. At the same time, you, you know within each microstructure what the local stresses are. If you have the governing uh, constituent relations say for the denomination, for example, you have lambda for the denomination, then if the stress state reach certain level, it will denominate, then you, you, you should be able to predict that, or fractures, or whatever other mechanism there. And for predicting discontinuities, uh, uh, do you uh, include cohesive elements in uh, yeah, you need, to, you need to include the co cohesive elements or those kind of elements within your eyes okay. to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the final question was in terms of discontinuities, uh, how do, uh, how well does the model predict uh, stress distribution around discontinuities? Because uh, if I understand, there's a homogenization process that uh, gives you the properties for the structure. When you go mm -hmm. with a dehomogenization approach, uh, does it uh, predict the stress fields around discontinuities well enough? Uh, yeah, it, it, then, you know, if we have discontinuities, you, you, you are we, let's use are we, you're more familiar or, or my concept HD here, should contain, uh, contain the discontinuity inside there, which your size of your structure should be big, big enough uh, to, to contain the discontinuities you want to capture. 
but at the structure level, what you represented is a kind of like a, a damaged uh, constituent relations for yeah. your structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, let's thank our speaker. Uh, that was a really nice talk, uh, talk Professor Yu. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I know it's a little bit over time now. Really appreciate it. If you're interested, feel free to write to me. You can Google my name. You should be able to find me. Uh, 